انا بتمنى ليكم سلامي صغر في ريبو بلدي ونتمتى من غربو لشردو ومن جنوبنا لشمالنا بلدنا بيهمنا والله هو الخالق بلدنا بيخصنا والله هو الخالق كل الأديان في بلدي بلا شخص ودولة اللي كلنا يخلي تفريقة بين الدين شمني بس أخوك جنوبي بلدنا بيهمنا والله هو الخالق conference as we all know is a uh, uh, South Sudan conflict resolution and which we hope brings peace but those two things the conflict resolution and peace are not an end in itself we are hoping that this will be elements that would deliver something much more than that which is what we hope for what dream and our goal that is to bring about uh, democracy and development of prosperity in South Sudan. And so we, 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 we want to take this further and this panel are going to give presentations uh, on that aspect of, uh, of, of the conference team that is towards sustainable peace and democracy and development in Southern Sudan. The presentation will be in the context, or, or rather will incorporate context of the implementation of the peace agreement that a South, Sudan, South Sudanese we're all supposed to pay attention to, because that's what is intended to deliver peace to us. Uh, there's supposed to be five people in this panel. Two of our members have not been able to make it because of uh, last minute uh, uh, logistic issues, but we do have their papers and we will uh, present those time permitting. Uh, we've been dealt a bad hand, five people, and we're supposed to be presenting only in a very short time, but we will try our best. I have a timer with me. When it goes off, it means you've gone 15 minutes. I'm not stopping you by all means, but just to let you know uh, so that uh, we can be able to keep track of the time. And these are the five uh, different areas that we will be talking on, restructuring and nurturing of government institutions by Dr. Sam Lucky, the necessity of human security, which is what I will be talking on, <coughs> balance of power, unipolar, bipolar, and multipolar, which Dr. Benai Yoma will be talking on, women in wartime and in South Sudan, that Dr. Jane Kani is supposed to be talking on. She's not here, but this is the voice of the women and we would like to present a paper as well. And then, of course, uh, the last part is on uh, uh, the uh, human, the humanitarian crisis in southern Sudan and the way forward that will be delivered by uh, Mr. Benaya Duku, and he's not here. And uh, uh, um, we will read his papers, brief remarks on that. So our first uh, speaker has already been introduced to you, uh, Dr. Sam Lucky. Uh, Sam Lucky is a professor of resource economics uh, at the International Center for Water Resources Management, Central State University, Wilberforce, Ohio. Uh, his research interests are water resources management, environmental economics, and economic development, and he has published numerous papers in scholarly journals. And Dr. Sam, I'd like to welcome you to get started in the presentation. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence and Henry. Uh, it's really been nice uh, sitting here the, since the day before yesterday and uh, listening to uh, uh, various speakers and all that. And uh, I enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, we all know that our problem is complex, uh, which may require also complex solutions and so on. Uh, when we were kind of uh, sitting down and discussing and trying to, uh, to figure out uh, what topic I was going to talk about, um, I looked at the uh, Compromise Peace Agreement and something just struck me that maybe I should talk about the institutions of government. I looked at it, I said, yes, here it is. This is the answer. Let me talk about the institutions of government. And yesterday, uh, Dr. Osborne gave uh, a nice uh, I mean, uh, presentation. And he talked about eight pillars uh, that are necessary for peace to be achieved. And one of the first pillars was a functional government. Well, it turns out that if you need those pillars to really be able to stand upright, you require some foundation. And the foundation for those pillars have to be real strong, otherwise they will collapse. And if you talk to civil engineers, they will tell you that in order to have a nice building, you really need very, very strong uh, foundation. So uh, I thought that was really um, kind of helped to sharpen my uh, presentation today. And when I talk about the uh, institutions of government, I'm really talking about all kinds of institutions, um, political institutions, social institutions, financial institutions, cultural institutions, and yes, legal institutions. And we all know very well that when we started out with the CPA in 2005, most of these institutions did not exist. So a government have to be started from scratch. And that is real, uh, a very big responsibility. Now also if you take into consideration the fact that the people that are charged with this big responsibility to set up this government had been in the resistance for 20 plus years and now they come out and they're supposed to put their guards down in uniform and all that and start setting up a government that is supposed to be functional that can deliver the goods and so on that transition that transition and up would be very very difficult if you had asked people like us who spent lots and lots of time uh, just uh, you know doing some research talking and teaching students and so on leave alone somebody who yesterday was in the bush of South Sudan so that is the the, uh, the problem that I want to dwell on uh, today uh, starting out with the three what the Americans call the three branches of government okay the executive the judiciary and the legislative now, when you look at um, the executive itself, the government had to form many ministries and populate them with people that are actually going to run these ministries and they are expected to deliver. And you know very well that if you, you form those ministries in a hurry, you will get all kinds of people and say, hey, you be the director general, this one will be the minister, and this one will be this, and so on. And yes, of course, they will accept any responsibility. But I'm telling you, um, even for where, where I work, it takes us almost one year to hire one professor. Because we have to advertise the position, then we, we give enough time for applicants to, to, to apply, then we screen the applications, we narrow them down, hold uh, phone interviews, Maybe invite three people on campus 
and then they will, you know, we ask them to talk, give presentations and so on. After that, then we make a choice. And that has pro proven to be very, very useful. I have colleagues that are hardworking, and we have very few problems and so on. They know what they are there, and they do, they do them very well. But the responsibility of having to start the government from ground up and so on is awfully difficult and so on. So that's the situation that we are, we are dealing with. The ministries are so many, um, you have so much bureaucracy, and systems are not, you know, uh, worked out in a way that the process themselves could work very uh, clearly. That's far as the government is concerned, the executive branch. Now, moving on to the uh, uh, National Assembly. Well, to begin with, we had two assemblies. The GOS Assembly in Juba, and then the Assembly for the you know, Government of National Unity in Khartoum. They were in the, in the, in the GOS government in Juba, there were 170 members of parliament. And then those that were sent to Khartoum were 96. Now, after independence, the uh, president of the republic added 66, because that's what the constitution demanded, the transitional constitution. So 170, then, you know, immediately after independence, the ones that were in the National Assembly in Khartoum were brought and then added to the ones that were already there in the assembly in Juba, and then 66 appointed. And now as a result of the uh, transitional agreement, the opposition is going to add another 50. It's going to be about 400 members of uh, uh, power. And the question is, uh, given that many people, are they going to be able to deliver? And then also looking at the resource base that we have. Do we have enough resources to be able to support uh, that many uh, uh, people? Now that's frozen in because that's, that's what the compromise peace agreement said. So we really need to worry about what emerges after that. If we are to reform the, uh, uh, the National uh, Legislative Assembly itself, how many would be adequate? What would be the optimum number? What would be their responsibility? We know that they are supposed to create laws, but even that itself, that mandate has not been very clear. Because what happened also is that in the hurry to form those institutions of government, we had the main party, which is SPLN, uh, and it just became almost like what somebody said uh, yesterday, that all of us became members of SPLN. Whether we carried cards or not, it, it didn't matter. So you find, you find people in the, in the executive branch are SPLM, people in the National Assembly are SPLM, people in the judiciary are SPLM. So if I'm supposed to be making laws in the National Assembly and the, uh, the executive branch is run by my party and my colleagues and so on, then you know, once the lines are not clearly uh, you know, divided, it becomes very difficult. We just begin to accept whatever we think is good for the, for the past party. In other words, there are no checks and balances. And that can as, as actually uh, 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 get into a situation whereby many things are passed that may not be necessarily good, even for the party in the long run. Okay? It may not be good for the party in the, in the, uh, in the long run. So as part of this uh, uh, compromise peace agreement, the, currently, we have what? A transitional uh, constitution. There is going to be a const constitutional review commission. And this constitutional review commission is actually going to be working on the permanent constitution. And now, with the experience so far that, that, that we've had in, you know, since 2005, they are likely to come up with a better constitution that can respond to the needs of the of the, uh, of the country, because that's absolutely uh, necessary to make sure that each branch of the government uh, functions the way it is supposed to, uh, to, to function. Another one also was for the third branch is the judiciary. It was again also put together in a hurry and all that, and that itself needs to, to be uh, 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 reformed. 
I've already talked about uh, working on a permanent constitution. That is going to be key because that itself would re will affect all the reforms that are going to take place as far as the uh, institutions are, uh, are concerned. What are the institutions, I mean the reforms that we need in the other areas? Political reform, okay? You need to reform the political system so that if you get into multi-party democracy, then there is room for every party to, 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 to function. And then you also have sex, checks and balances and clear-cut rules so that each party or each uh, segment of society, uh, including you know individuals uh, like you and my, I can function freely and contribute, and, and so on. Uh, one of the institutions also is um, the uh, Central Bank of, uh, Bank of South Sudan. Uh, when I went home uh, in June this year, uh, because of the hardship that we've already experienced, uh, the uh, the exchange rate was 12 pounds per dollar, one dollar in the black market. By the time I left, it was already 17. And since a lot of the stuff that is consumed in Juba were, you know, imported, uh, life was really becoming difficult, even for those people that were uh, working and assumed that they have uh, good uh, uh, jobs. Uh, so the, the, the institution itself, because it's new, Looking at the experiences that he's got, I mean, he's gotten, so, I mean, so far, um, it can be reformed and it can function better. And most of these things, there are provisions in the compromise peace agreement, as far as these reforms are concerned. But most of, most of them have not been clearly defined because they are supposed to be negotiated by whoever is participating in the compromise peace agreement. It's a subject for negotiation that they are going to sit down and basically using the experiences that they have, then they have to decide what direction uh, the institution, to, you know, the bank itself, or this Bobizio Renault and other policies are kind of uh, are concerned. Um, and then, as far as the institution is concerned, we already talked a lot about the, um, the eight, I mean, the 10 states, and of course, uh, Rakhmachar suggested what uh, 21 states and what how much 21, 21. 21 states and then the uh, the president passed a decree recently creating 20 28 uh, uh, states and then of course there's a lot of discussion about whether uh, the creation of these states are in line with the provisions of the compromise peace agreement or, or even whether they are in line with the provisions of the transitional constitution that is supposed to be uh, in place currently. So there's, there's been a lot of debate uh, in that area and I know a lot of my colleagues inside, uh, inside the country and outside the country have talked about that and the discussion is all over, all over the place. Now, the most important thing is that from the perspective of uh, you know, an academician like me, this is something that there should be a dialogue. What is the optimal size? Do we have the resources? And then if so, if we have the resources, how do we proceed? Because you see, South Sudan has 64 ethnic groups. Uh, when the, uh, the, 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 the decree was uh, you know, passed recently, there were many people that were celebrating because they are getting their state. But there are others that are miserable because they have been put together with people that they don't like. Okay. That they don't like. So, it's like we are moving from one stage of, you know, the problem to to, 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 to another. I know if people were to sit down and start discussing, it would be messy. It's not going to be very easy. Uh, but I tell you, there is no easy way, easier way out uh, the way things are, things are in, that, in that country. For instance, I come from Central Equatoria. Uh, Central Equatoria has, is, is supposed to be divided into uh, three, uh, three different states. Uh, Jubek State, that's for Juba, Yay, and then Tarekeka. 
Now, looking at uh, uh, Jubek, Jubek State, there are some ethnic minorities in, in Juba. The Bari are the majority. Then you have the Nyangbara, Terekeka, Luruba, I mean, sorry, the uh, Nyangbara, uh, Sampojuru, which is pa part of my uh, community, split into two. One, one community in Juba, Jubek State, and then the other one in, in the East State. You bet they are not happy because they don't want to be split into two states. And then the, the ones that are ethnic minority in Juba state, they don't like it. In Yai district, which is supposed to be my new state, there are eight ethnic groups. The main ones are three. The other five minorities, they are uncomfortable because they think that they're going to be dominated by the major ones. Terekeka state has a small population of about 140,000 uh, people. It's mainly the, the, the Mundari. Uh, but most of you are aware that when it comes to the uh, uh, education, the Mundari have not done very well. So that it's going to be even difficult to get the critical mass of people that are going to uh, make, you know, uh, make sure that that state itself is, uh, is, uh, is functional and so on. So I'm just giving you an example of you know, one current state, which is Central Nicodera, which is supposed to be in uh, uh, you know, three, three different states. The question then is, what is the optimal size? Okay, so now we have 10, then we have, uh, we have 21, and then we have 28. <clears throat> and we're talking about compromises. If I were, if, if I, if I were to, to, to have an opinion, I would say, maybe I can go up to 18. And it would have to be 16 Greater Bragazal, 16 Greater Equatoria, 16 Greater Apanaya. Because I want most of these ethnic groups to remain together in one state so that they can learn to get along. Because if the idea is really separating them and so on, then we are not going to be moving towards unity. They have to learn how to work together in one bigger, bigger state, which is a little bit more viable and so on. Uh, but I think that also what is going to be key, actually, is the, um, the permanent constitution. Because in as much as everyone is saying that by creating more states, we're actually moving, we're moving the, uh, the uh, uh, government closer to the people, which sounds good. But it's not just creating more states. It's the evolution of power. What powers do these states have? What powers do the counties have? What powers do the local government have? If you give them more power, then maybe at the local level, they can be able to do certain things that will be good for them without interference from the central government. And these are the kinds of things that need to be uh, uh, specified in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Constitution. So my suggestion, you know, uh, I remember I said suggestion because uh, we are all so much charged, I don't want somebody to stand up and say, hey, there's somebody who is coming up with a proposal of 18 states. In, in the academia, we suggest yes. And there's, no, there's nothing wrong about that. It's a suggestion that is for, for, for discussion. 18 states, each state should have no more than <coughs> five counties. <coughs> okay. And of course, whether it's the governor, the county commissioners, and so on, have to be elected. I went and visited uh, Central Equatorial State. The bureaucracy is just the, mi the mirror image of the federal government. You know, so many ministries, so many commissions. There's so much redundancy within Central Equatorial State itself. Such that I actually found some of my friends that, that are well educated, literally sitting, doing nothing. Because they are, they are just made heads of commissions that even don't function and so on. We need to streamline the, you know, uh, the, uh, the structures so that these structures can be able to, 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 to deliver. So I guess what I'm, what I'm talking about is that without good functioning institutions, which was one of the pillars that Dr. Osborne was talking about, it's extremely difficult to deliver whatever it is that you want to, 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 to deliver. Yes, a lot of these institutions are new, uh, we're likely to make mistakes when we set up institutions that are new, but uh, we've had um, 
uh, you know, quite some time to study them and make sure that we fix them so that what emerges at the end is real well-functioning institutions that at the end of the 30-month uh, transitional government, we will then have a government that will be backed by well-functioning institutions that will be able to deliver what it is that they are supposed to, to be uh, uh, able to deliver with a good functioning in, uh, constitution that all of us should respect. Nobody should be above the law. Okay? And I know what my friends are going to talk about the security problem and all that. Uh, literally, when I went there, everybody was complaining. Everybody was complaining. Even some of those people that uh, I was meant to understand were doing very well, they were complaining. Because if things are not running properly, then of course uh, nobody is going to be happy at the end of the, of the, of the day. So, um, okay. so, so given this uh, 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 kind of difficult situation that, that, that we are looking at, where do we go from here? And I will basically end up asking the question, what is it that the transitional government of national unity that's supposed to function for the next 30 months is supposed to achieve? What is it? Until, until we figure out what it is exactly, so that we can put all the structures and all the reforms and all that in place, so that at the end of the 30 month period, we get what we wanted, and then we can move on from there, and all of us are going to be happy. Um, if we get that right, that's good. But if we don't get it right, then it will be a 30-month a, a break from, you know, bickering and what have you and so on. And I tell you, our society, uh, like what other people say yesterday, was very much polarized. I'll give you one example. When um, uh, Chairman Ladukubak was going to be uh, inaugurated, I accepted to come and speak. You know, he had Minnesota there. Came all the way from Dayton. And when I was on my way, uh, a young man that I know called me. And I said, oh, I'm heading to Minnesota. I said, what are you going to do? And I said, you know, I'm going to be speaking because, uh, uh, you know, Brother Ladu Kubek is going to be the chair of the uh, uh, SPLM chapter. He said, Uncle, why would you want to do that? <laughs> SBLA is the one that messed us up. And you want to go and support them? <laughs> I said, the people that are in the party are not from another planet. They are your own countrymen. And you have to learn <laughs> how to deal with them. If you can't learn how to deal with them, or how to work with them, you don't have a country. Because you spend a lot of time fighting. And then, at some point, at some point, some folks in the State Department say, hey, there are South Sudanese in academia. This one group that we have not talked to, we're getting frustrated. We've been meeting in Addis Ababa for a long time. Call them, we want to hear what they're, what they're talking about. And we went there and suggested many reforms. And uh, I think there was a piece or something. And some people are calling me and say, what happened? Are you joining the opposition? I say, what opposition? He said, oh, you said something that is not good for the government. What government? Because all these people that are fighting uh, are members of the government as far as I'm concerned because all of them call themselves says Belen. Who is who? So the government is fighting itself? If that's the case, then we need, we need this government to fight itself. I'm not joining no opposition. And I'm like, I, I told them that I like most of you, I have the luxury because in academia, I have that freedom. If we sit there in a meeting and the purpose of the universe come up with a suggestion and I don't like it, or I think that it doesn't work, I'll stand up and say, this is a second man in the university, and I say, sir, that is not going to work because of this reason and all that and all. And he said, okay, we're going to study that. He doesn't get angry because how dare you? How dare you? You know, ask such a question. He, he instead sits down and says, that's interesting. 
Maybe you need to stop at my office and I want to, to know more about that uh, thread of thought. And then sometimes we arrive at a compromise and I said, hey, maybe can we revisit it after six months or one year and see whether it's working? And if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. That's how things work. If you get into little cocoons that every little thing that happened has to be dissected and what have you, you're either with us and not with us, you are in trouble, my friends. Thank you very much. Ask you a question in regard to, because you suggested that uh, there has to be some sort of uh, military, all the groups should be included in, in Southern Army. Because you, thought, you said that the Northern Dinka are dominated the army. But the reason why the Northern Dinka dominated the army is because they want to push in numbers in 1983, which is fact. And the second is that the reason recently, even in 2012, when we were fighting the North, the government, uh, try to mobilize the youth across South Sudan. Most of the youth that went to the training center were mostly from the Nguyen Dinka areas. In Kotoran, the Kotoran did not participate. Yeah. And you cannot force people. So my question to you, because you said that, uh, my question to you, because you see, you said that the only solution <coughs> to bring peace is for Selva Kiir and Emasha to step aside. Now, will that suggestion, uh, will it be in line with the compromise peace agreement? That is the question that I direct to you. Because you suggested that the way to bring peace will be these two guys should step aside. But will it go, will it be in line with the compromise peace agreement that we want to implement? My, the other question that I want to ask to Dr. Henry is the issue of militarization. Uh, you said that uh, the way that, that we need to, to reduce militarism in the South, on which we all agree. But the question to you is, if we need to reform the security sector, how do we reform the security sector while this agreement, the compromise agreement imposed by the Western countries, is allowing the rebels even to integrate over 150,000? Because intellectually speaking, when you look, because one of the problems we have in the South Sudan is that we emerge from the rebellion, because most of our leaders, they were former rebel commanders. There is too much militarization in South Sudan. Most of the people are holding guns even in the village. So if you want to reverse that, then you have to reduce the level of militarization. But how do we achieve it if the very countries that we expect to think like a civilized country are imposing an agreement that actually will increase the number of the forces? Rima Shah said he has 150,000 forces. So now 150,000 forces will be added to 300,000 forces of the, of the government. And then you will be even having close to half a million forces. So intellectually speaking, how do we reduce militarization while the very agreement imposed by Edgar Plus hmm, is doing the contrary? The question that we have to... Can you yeah. speed up your time? Okay, this question to Dr. Sam Lucky is the question of uh, your suggestion of 18 states. Can you educate me if we go with your suggestion? How do you divide the relate to two states, taking into consideration the problem between the Nuer White Army and the Dean Kabor, the problem of Murle with the Nuer and, uh, and Dinka, because in Jogule, the Murle are given a people at Mesetu area because they complain of being mistreated by the Nuer and Dinka. So looking into those complexities, can you educate me how you, your suggestion will work? Thank you. There's going to be two women and three men, so, and there's no comment about that. That's the way I like. One minute, please. One minute. No comment. Uh, no comment. I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm a straightforward person. Absolutely, we like that. And I shoot straight. And this is all for the commission here, uh, okay. the academician. Uh, it's nice to sit here and all of you have PhDs and uh, master's degrees and give us all this wonderful presentation. One, one thing that I hate is that we always rely on human rights report, UN report, and all that NGOs report. Yes. Why don't we, uh, like you guys with all your PhD, go to South Sudan and do your own report to counteract what the human rights and UN uh, report is saying? That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, next, yeah. 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 Ye
Uh, I will be just direct to the question. I'm not going to explain anything. Uh, my question is going to Henry. Uh, I wonder where you come up with a cow head. I want you to explain that very well. And thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We have one here. That's a lady. They have one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay. Um, thank you. My name is Victoria Kitabi, Chair Lady of the Kujulu Community. That's an equatorial side. Um, my sister already mentioned there, those three guys. If there's other two more, I think we'll solve the problem, but there's a little bit something missing. Out of our discussion since yesterday, or three days that we have been here, is missing. I know Southern Sudan is sick. I'm sick. The doctor already declared I'm sick with the ill like this. Okay, what's the treatment? The doctor recommended me that the treatment will be like this. But there's a missing there in South Sudan that we don't have the counselors. We don't have the therapists. Those people need the therapists. Those guys here, they will solve the problem if we have the counselors there. Because to tell me, even though this problem that I've said that we need a counselor, because we here, I know from marriage, there's a counselor. A child has a counselor when you're going through a problem. It will take you a year, two years for you to get straight your mind back to where you originally supposed to be a child or a, a grown up person that is with a clear mind. So we need the counselor and the therapy of doctors. All of you guys here that are sitting there, you guys have those diplomas. Whatever papers you guys have it, please try to change the title for those three things that we are missing in South Sudan. Otherwise, pretty much we have all the positions that in South Sudan we have, but we have What's three things. That my question is that how can we get those people, the counselors, can we get a help from the Americans to help us? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, it's great. Uh, we are running out of time, please. <laughs> thank you for coming forward. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, before I could ask my question, I want to uh, say uh, my, my colleague, my former colleague, and my brother, Henry, did you call it? Uh, we were colleagues 30 years ago in the University of Juba. I went to Bush to fight as a freedom fighter, and he went to Japan to be a PhD holder. And I am, <laughs> I am so impressed from his presentation. It's so helpful, and I believe he will be a good fruit and product for South Sudan problems. And, and I want to say thank you, Henry, for, for doing that. Keep on doing the good job. My question is, my name is Isaac Downing Malik. I'm from Gorky State, a newly formed state in South Sudan. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I have a problem with Brother Sam. Yeah, Yongo. Yeah, those 28 states must stay. And because they, they are so fair for all of us in South Sudan. No. I have to ask you a question. Uh, my question is, you big PhD holders, you are so productive and well informed. Is there anything you are thinking to do in South Sudan? Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have one lady uh, to conclude with, please. Sorry. Can I some four questions? Yeah. Uh, this is the six. <laughs> Thank you very much for our academic Please, your voice. Please give us time. Thank you, uh, our professors and doctors of South Sudan. When uh, somebody sees you doing something like this, it's, it's a, a pride and, and uh, I'm proud of you. Uh, but um, what I really wanted to uh, to see one day in, in South Sudan happening is that this knowledge to try to to voice your voice also so that people can hear you what you what you are trying to do not only theories in the papers but not in practice. Um, my question is to Dr. Uh, Banaya uh, um, you you more sorry you mentioned uh, we are try we are here to solve the problem and you you blame the newer. 
you blame the Dinkas, but I didn't hear the Equatorians. The, 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 the role they play in the media, we should tell the truth because we are here to face ourselves and, to, and tell the truth. The role they play in the media, we, we are not going here to mention it, but you know. That's your question. So, the young, the young uh, Equatorian people also, the, the role they play in this war, although they, they were not like carrying the gun to follow, but they were carrying the gun of the, of the pencil to write in, in the social media and puring the gas in what is happening in South Sudan instead to come up as mediators and solving the problem and bring the, the, the peace to South Sudan. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, because of time constraints, we cannot accommodate all the questions. If you have any question, very tangible, you can write it down and uh, during the break time, maybe when we come for the discussion, you will get the answers. Just write them down and bring them to, to the doctors. Thank you so much. Oh, oh I begin, okay. <laughs> I think two of the questions that I answered were the one about the head of state and the two leaders going. No, I'm not, I would say before the peace agreement, I did not want them to be there. But now the peace side, I accept it. Because that is the reality. Okay? But I wanted a peace agreement where they were excluded. Because they mismanaged the country and brought war, which is shown to South Sudan, and they are responsible for it. So now I accept it, because peace is aside for you. So that's okay. Now, Equatorians. When I was talking about multi-purpose, actually because of the time, I had always told my Equatorian friends that this polarization of Dinka, Equatorian, and where is dangerous. It's going to lead to explosion. Just like the polarization in Nigeria among Igbo, Yoruba, and Hausa. That led to explosion. And I told the Equatorians, even Equatorians alone can win an election. Because they will be one third of the country, Barbazan one third, Abana one third. If they want to come to power, they have to extend their influence to other areas, make alliances and so on. So I'm going to speak about everybody. Alright? So, why do the Equatorians, the Dinka, the Nuer, live out? Where are the Mure? Where are the Fatih? Where are the, 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 the what? The, Mur, the other groups, the, the Anwar and so on, the Shiru. So, this polarization in three groups is dangerous. These are, I've always said this, alright? Sorry I didn't bring it out here. Alright? Uh, the other point was about. Oh, Alfred Bush, the 80s. You see, the war did not begin in 19. The war became earlier. When the agreement of 1972 was signed, the South was allocated 6,000 troops. What I could do was to divide them equally. Barbazan, 2,000. Abana, 2,000. Equatorian, 2,000. Even if the Equatorian should be the dominant group in the first war, there was a national sacrifice. We have to make national sacrifices. I had even met to some people in the government that you see, let us retire the old people and give them handsome retirement benefit. Five and for five. Okay. And we give them a good benefit and fill their vacancies with younger people. I'm not against the whole shop. I'm happy. We broke independence. But if they cannot run the civil service, let us give them something and say, do business, do something and so That I have said to some people. Is it? And uh, so, but okay, does this what they have to go to fight now and form their own front when they come and get integrated? <laughs> I mean, this is the question now. Because if the Nuer are fighting, the Dinka are fighting, so if you don't want to go to fight, you will be excluded. Where are we going to go? Anything to do? Oh, why don't we go to South Sudan and do our own research? I told you I wrote a book. We were, I wanted to go to South Sudan after the, at the end of the war. I thought with my economic background, I could teach the county commissioners, or even some government officials, what to do about economic development. Because you don't take a military officer and make him a county commissioner without giving him some training. You are not fair with this guy. <laughs> this guy might want to do something good, but doesn't have the background. The question is, UN uh, human rights, all these NGOs, they go there and write 
I have not relied on it. I have not. Okay, right? All these negative, you know, reports about South Africa. Why didn't we go and go and write a report to come to act what has been written in the Greenland? We don't have we don't have the resources. Because we I, I said I want to go there. The, the, the UNDP has a, a stipend. If you if the government asks, they can send you there. I have three months every year off to keep. I applied to the UNDP, they agreed if somebody in Juba can ask me to come. Nobody. In fact, Khartoum asked me to come. <laughs> Before separation. Khartoum with many people asked me to come. But Juba refused. They were not going to spend even a cent on me. I was involved during the, 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 the jam thing, the jam kind of thing, because I was three months off. Uh, me and then one bank and some people got into one bank, we went to the South Sudan to new side and be with you know, to talk to the SLM, to talk to the Sudan government about their peace programs. We are willing to do things, but we as teachers don't have the money. So if the government can avail the money, instead of some people touring all over the world, you don't know what they go for all over the world, <laughs> we could have that. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's all of us. I grab <laughs> What? Any other question? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gordon. You asked a very uh, interesting question. Well, I did say that uh, what I was throwing out is a proposal. Uh, I had suggested that uh, maybe there could be uh, six states in the Greater Upper Nile not specifically about Jongole, uh, but proposal in the true of academia, that's what it is. And uh, if we are to move to the next table, the, a level, uh, say with a proposal, <coughs> Gordon, Yomo, and anybody that is interested will sit at the table and discuss and dissect it and look at it and maybe come up with something. Uh, uh, compromise, but the issue that you raise is real. It's something that is uh, real. Whenever we're talking about creation of new states, some people are going to be happy and others will be uh, very unhappy. Uh, but if we do it systematically so that we can be able to uh, uh, minimize that unhappiness, uh, that would be uh, a lot uh, better. And even some of this unhappiness, I mean happiness, may not be necessarily uh, good because it, you know there were many people that were celebrating because they got states that they uh, they liked and the other day uh, somebody was asking me and I said well this thing is put together in a hurry it's not a good idea uh, we need to do it in a better way and the individual happened to come from Ju I mean Jubek State and he said uncle why are you saying that if they created more states for themselves and they're going home is it not a good idea? <laughs> That's what he said. And I said, do you really understand what all, the, all that is? We still have a federal government. You have to have federal workers throughout the, the country. So it's not uh, anything that you're talking about. People have to go back and just run their states and then they will really leave you in your own, own state alone and so on. So it's a, it's a complex uh, uh, problem. And like what I said before, it's just a, a proposal. Now, uh, as far as the... Um, contribution is concerned, uh, um, I never mentioned this, but Uncle David sitting there uh, was my director general when I started working after my undergraduate uh, uh, days. And uh, I'm telling you, he's very humble, but the work that he did in the area of agriculture, this was in the regional minister of agriculture, was really, really a lot. With the little money that we had that time, there were so many projects that were studied. The other day, somebody came to me and said, I read an article saying that South Sudan could export uh, coffee. Isn't this nice? I look at him and I say, this is not new. I looked in that project before. There were many projects in coffee, tea, timber, uh, um, uh, even cotton. Um, some Irish potatoes grow very well on the, you know, hilltops of Gilo and all that. That country is so rich. 
that in fact if we were to put our differences aside and really concentrate on how we can develop it and help ourselves, we wouldn't even be fighting among ourselves because there will be enough resources for each and every one of us. And so we could do that. And also recently, um, when, when I was home in Juba, I went many times to Juba University to reconnect with my colleagues and so on, even collected some books and took them along because, you know, they don't have them. I can get books free as a professor here to adapt to them. And these are real good books that are very expensive. Uh, sometimes the difficulty is transportation. We could even collect and send men of them there. 